Welcome back to Kirstie's Virtual Classroom. Today in California Geology, we are talking all about the volcanoes in California. So more specifically, the Cascades and Modoc Plateau. So the general setting of California volcanic areas, we have three main separate areas, the Modoc Plateau, Long Valley Calde Caldera, which we talked about with Basin and Range, and the Cascades. So to give you reference, we talked about the Long Valley Caldera when we talked about the Basin and Range Province because Long Valley Caldera is in the Basin and Range Province. The Modoc Plateau is its own province. And then we have the Cascades, which starts at Mount Lassen here in northeastern California and extends to Mount Shasta, and then the volcanoes that head uh, to the North Pacific, Northwest Pacific. Okay, so looking at the uh, Cascade Volcanoes, <clears throat> you can um, actually look at the current situations of each of the different volcanoes, um, look at weekly updates. So here's an example of a weekly update from 2019. Um, this show, you can click on each of the different volcano centers and look at their current conditions um, and any kind of articles related to them through this Cascades Volcano Observatory. So talking about the Modoc Plateau, this is east of the Cascades. Um, it's a high, relatively flat country that's cut by valleys. We see an arid climate in this area and very young volcanism. And by young volcanism, I mean that it's less than 3 million years old. Um, so that's relatively young in geologic age. Um, we do see Medicine Lake Volcano and Lava Beds National Monument here. So Modoc Plateau um, had its last major war between Native America and the U.S. government between 1872 and 1873. Um, there were 150 Modoc Indians that eluded 650 army troops for seven months using rough volcanic terrain to their advantage. So this is Medicine Lake Volcano. Um, it is east of the Cascade Range and it is approximately 50 kilometers um, east northeast of Mount Shasta. So we're looking in very northeastern portion of California. So the Medicine Lake Volcano is a shield volcano. It is the largest volcano in the Cascade Range. It fills up the entire southern skyline, which is about 150 miles around the base, and is about 7,900 feet high, or 2,400 meters high. The Medicine Lake Volcano is unique, and it has many small magma chambers rather than one large one. Um, so it has a lot of feeders in the area rather than just one giant magma chamber um, like we see in um, Yellowstone. Yellowstone has a very massive magma chamber below it. This one's got a lot of small, it kind of independent magma chambers. So here's a look at Medicine Lake. Um, volcano and another kind of aerial shot of it. So we see a lot of basaltic through rhyolitic compositions. So there is basalt and rhyolite that comes out of this volcano. Most of those are coming from some of those individual magma chambers, not necessarily mixed magma chambers. The most recent eruption was about 900 years ago, um, and there have been at least 17 eruptions that have occurred over the last 12,000 years. And on average, each century, about one to two eruptions. Um, the eruptions tend to be very episodic um, and kind of unpredictable. Um, it is part of an old caldera that used to be in the area. Here's another look at Medicine Lake Volcano. Now looking at Mount Shasta, this is a shaded relief map um, of the area. So here's Mount Shasta, and then here we have Medicine Lake Volcano. So it's about 30 miles um, from Mount Shasta, and the red outline is the extent of um, Medicine Lake Volcano. Um, so this is the main dome here, but this is kind of the extent of it. So Medicine Lake Volcano lies in a strongly east-west extensional tectonic environment, slightly east of the main Cascades, like I mentioned, um, in the Modoc Plateau uh, 
province. It is located at the intersection of major tectonic features, ex including the northwestern extension of the Walker Lake Fault Zone. So the volcano is positioned at a kink where the northwest trending faults enter the volcano from the south, turn to the northeast, and then back to the northwest. Therefore, it is located within a zone of crustal weakness that likely provides a preferred pathway for magmas to reach the surface. The regional fault trends are the primary control on vent locations. So, as the faults in the area move, we are going to see more episodes of volcanic eruptions. So, wherever the faults move, that's where we're going to see a lot more crustal weakness. So that crustal weakness allows for magma from the mantle to actually come up to the surface, like in a divergent plate boundary situation. Um, and all of those different zones are going to kind of change the location of where we're going to see volcanic eruptions. It's not like um, Mount St. Helens, where we have a clear vent that the lava will predominantly come from. Um, this is why this also has several different magma chambers is because depending on where the most crustal weakness is in the area, you're going to see the actual eruption of the material. So the volcano is constructed mainly of mafic lavas. So like I said, a lot of it is basaltic. Some of it ranges into the andesite um, varieties. Um, drill hole data indicates that a larger volume of rhyolite is present than is indicated by surface mapping. So drill hole data is we take a drill, and we take a core out of the surface, or sorry, out of the ground, and um, we look at the rocks that come up, and the rocks that come up are not necessarily all mafic or basaltic in nature, which is what we see primarily on the surface of the area around Medicine Lake Volcano. So because there's a lot of rhyolite down there, um, it indicates that maybe the rhyolite was in place before the volcano transitioned to more of a basaltic volcano and this is primarily because we have a lot of different feeders of those magma chambers so each of those magma chambers could be different slightly different have slightly different chemistries and because of that we're going to see differences in the rock type that is actually produced from the volcano So looking at Lava Beds National Park, or National Monument, excuse me, um, this encompasses about 73 square miles on the northern flank of Medicine Lake Volcano and displays mostly basaltic and some of the andesite lavas. So going through the stages of volcanism from about 500,000 to 300,000 uh, years ago, we saw slightly silicic volcanism. So this is it has a lot more silica and oxygen in it, which are indicative of more caldera-esque lavas. So the earliest dated lava was a rhyolite, which was 475,000 years ago. So this rhyolite is predominantly comes from calderas, like I mentioned. Um, so this is why it is believed that this was an ancient caldera before it transitioned into a shield volcano. Um, so this single rhyolite unit may be equally as voluminous as the largest basaltic units of the volcano. So it is a significant amount of material that is found. Um, so it's not emplaced from some other event. This came from this volcano. Um, and is nearly half uh, nearly five times larger in volume than the largest Holocene silicic eruptive event from Glass Mountain. Only four of the 18 mapped stage one units are basalt. So that's pretty significant, which means that most of those are rhyolite, two of which are dated at 445,000 years. Moving into stage two, which is between 300,000 years ago and 180,000 years ago, we see about one third of the volcano's eruptive units were in place during this interval. So this is the most active time period in which the volcano was producing the most material. Um, this was dominated by basaltic and andesitic lava flows. So here we're seeing a transition from the highly silicious material, which has 
probably all been evacuated in stage one from the magma chamber. And now in stage two, all that's left is the basaltic and the andesitic lava or magma. And so that's what we see on the surface for this stage two um, in this time frame. So we do see dacite eruptions that also occurred late in the stage, and it culminated with the eruption of the volcano's only ash flow tuff. So there's only one ash flow tuff here, um, and that's usually more indicative of calderas as well. So then we get into stage three, which is the caldera rim construction. So that's 180,000 to 100,000 years ago. So approximately 80 mapped stage three eruptive units are exposed over about the quarter of the volcano. Um, eruptions in the stage three were predominantly basalt, basaltic, andesite, and andesite. Only a single low silica rhyolite and dacite are mapped, which means it wasn't the primary component of the magma chamber. And late in this time period, much of the present caldera rim was constructed by eruptions from vents along arcuate caldera ring faults. So what this means is that the actual ring that we see today of the volcano was being constructed between 180,000 years ago to 100,000 years ago. Then in stage four, we see a lot of basaltic material. So this is from a thousand years or hundred thousand years ago to thirteen thousand years ago. Um, so this stage is a little bit longer than stage three, but it includes fewer units. Um, so there are less eruptions over this longer time span. Um, and several of the sixteen basaltic eruptions in this group produce significant volumes of fluid lava. Four basaltic andesites, two andesites, and one low silica dacite erupted early in this period. The single rhyolite has an age of about 30,000 years. Then getting into the last stage, which is stage five, post-glacial. This is about 12,000 years ago to present. Um, there are at least 17 eruptions that occurred um, since the end of the glaciation, which is between uh, one and two eruptions per century on average. A significant amount of this area, of the area and the volume of the stage was generated in the giant crater event that occurred just after the end of the glaciation. So kind of a release of the material right after glaciers retreated in the area. Between 3,000 and 900 years ago, eruptions produced approximately one square mile of lava ranging in composition from basalt to rhyolite. So big range of material being produced here. Uh, but the late Holocene lava compositions include basalt and andesite, but silicic lavas are dominant. So this volcano is very changed. It changes a lot. Um, so depending on what magma chamber wants to erupt, that's where we're going to see whatever type of material it is. So we see some rhyolite, we see some basalt, we see kind of everything in this most recent stage. Whereas if we kind of take a look back, stage four, we saw mostly basaltic material. Stage three, we saw kind of a mixture of the basaltic andesite and the andesite and a little bit of basalt. Stage two, most of what we saw was dacite. And then stage one, we don't see a whole lot of material left over, but more of it was rhyolite than we've seen in more recent st stages. Excuse me. All right, so here's another look at Medicine Lake Volcano. Um, this aerial view west across the upper part of Medicine Lake Volcano is pointed towards Mount Shasta, which you can see kind of in the background here. Um, and this is the Glass Mountain Flow, which erupted about 950 uh, years ago. And it is outlined here for you in white. So looking at the volcano, on um, a little bit different of a map showing the caldera rim and some of the different eruptions. So we just looked at the glass mountain eruption here, which is outlined over on the um, east side here. Uh, the green line actually represents the hazard zone right now. Um, this is the limit of the most hazardous areas and you don't necessarily wanna be in these areas, although there are still campgrounds and picnic areas you can hang out in. Um, you just want to be weary if you visit these areas. 
The orange dashed line indicates the phreatic magmatic hazard zone limit. So this indicates the likely extent of these hot volcanic mud um, that would extend from the current vent of the volcano. And then the hot spot or red X over here on the eastern portion of the map along the caldera rim is the site of the volcano's only fumarole which is an opening near a volcano, which is where a lot of the gases can escape. Looking at Lava Bed's monument, here's an image of it. There are lots of these really cool lava tubes, um, and we'll talk about how those are formed. Um, but this lies in the northeast flank of the Medicine Lake volcano. Here's another lava tube in the area. They basically look like caves. There's another image of one. Here's kind of a size reference for you, about two people tall, average people. So Lava Beds Monument is a gentle slope and very fluid lava area um, that created these lava tubes that I just showed you. So lava that can be up to 2000 degrees Fahrenheit will flow downhill and immediately begins to cool and solidify upon contact with the ground and the air. So the lava touching the ground then solidifies first, followed by the sides and then the top of the flow. So then in between that, lava can flow basically through this tube of rock that was just created by the lava flow. So this is a hard shell of cooled lava that insulates the liquid rock inside, allowing it to flow a long distance before it actually cools and comes to a stop. The lava continues to flow until it either drains out or seals the end of the lava tube. So here's a look at that. So we have this flat lying area and lava flows will kind of form these channels, kind of like water will form stream channels, right? And as that occurs, it starts to solidify everything on the bottom and on the sides. And eventually the rocks on top will solidify. And now we basically just have this underground pipe for the lava to actually flow. Now this lava has to be really hot and low silica. So the low silica is important because the lower the silica, the higher the viscosity of the, or sorry, the lower the viscosity of the lava will be. So the low viscosity lavas will flow a lot quicker and further than viscosities that are really, really high because they're too sticky to flow. Um, so we want low silica, low viscosity lavas that are very, very hot um, in order to form these lava tubes. And then eventually, once the lava flow cuts off, you can be left with these hardened tubes where lava used to flow and they basically become like a cave. Here's another look at what that might look like. Here we have a volcano that erupted. The lava flow uh, was flowing down a channel or creating a channel and the material around it start, started to solidify and lava continued to flow and kind of the rock insulated that lava that was flowing. And then eventually all of the material is escaped from the volcano, maybe it becomes dormant, and you're left with these really neat lava tubes. All right, skipping over to Long Valley Caldera, which we've talked about previously, but we're gonna talk about more now. Uh, so Long Valley Caldera is on the eastern side of the Sierra Nevada. Um, it is bounded by uh, the Mono Craters and Mammoth Lakes. Mammoth Mountain, um, and then we have most of the hot spots happening right here, kind of in the center of the caldera. So this is kind of a look at the caldera. It's all of this low-lying area. There's not a really good uh, visual on the extent of the boundary of the volcano. Um, it's just based on where we see any active hot springs or fumaroles or anything like that. So this is the western edge of the Basin Range Province, which we talked about before. Um, the volcanic activity here started <clears throat> 3.6 million years ago, um, and we see a lot of different rock chemistries coming from this volcano as well. Uh, the volcano formed, or sorry, the caldera formed, excuse me, 760,000 years ago. 
Uh, we see ash deposited as far as Kansas. And we also see it um, on the east, or sorry, the western side of the Sierra Nevadas as well in the San Joaquin River area. Um, and it formed what we call the Bishop Tuff. Here is the eruption reach. I've shown you this before. Um, so here's some of the ash fall from the Long Valley Caldera. Here is what Mount St. Helens would have produced. And then we also have some ash fall from Yellowstone to kind of see the comparison. Um, Long Valley is up there with the big hitters like Yellowstone in production as far as ash fall goes. Here is a look at the Bishop Tuff. It is a large deposit of pyroclastic debris that erupted about 760,000 years ago. Um, this is Chalfant Valley, about 25 kilometers west of Long Valley Caldera. Southwest, excuse me. Uh, the floor elevation is 6,500 feet on the east and 8,500 on the west. Um, the walls of the volcano or the caldera are 500 feet in the east and 1,300 feet to 3,000 feet in the west. So this is the approximate outline. Here's Mono Lake. Um, Yosemite Valley is over here. Um, this is Lake Crawley, so this kind of gives you an extent here of what the cald what size of the caldera approximately is. Here's another look at it. This is Lake Crawley here. Okay, so the Mono Inyo volcanic chain, which I've kind of alluded to before, is a linear chain of volcanoes from Long Valley Caldera to Mono Lake. So this is kind of the northern extent of Long Valley Caldera. These guys formed 40,000 years ago, and the youngest crater erupted uh, 1472 AD. So it's been a minute before these have actually produced any eruptions. Uh, within Mono Lake, the youngest explosion was 150 years ago. So here's a look at those volcanoes. So here are the Mono craters, and they're in this kind of linear fashion extending from the northern caldera boundary of Long Valley Caldera. And so what is surmised is that this is a main magma chamber that has feeders in kind of a linear fashion. We also see this with Moro rock in the coast ranges. The hydrology in the area is quite interesting. There are a lot of streams that extend from the Sierra Nevada mountain range into this lower area. But um, what's interesting because we have a volcanic situation is we get a lot of hot water. So we do monitor these different hot springs for um, gas releases and their temperatures. Um, and that kind of tells us what the volcano is doing, where areas are more active than other areas. Um, and we kind of monitor that that way we know more of what's going on with the volcano um, because as of late it doesn't have a whole lot going on other than creating these hot springs and then mammoth mountain we talked about a little bit already um the south this is the southwest edge of long valley caldera near mammoth lakes um, we have high concentrations of co2 and soil gas that are killing the trees which we've talked about um, this was first noticed in 1990 where there was an area of about 170 acres that is just completely dead from the CO2 gas being released. Um, it's most impressive that you can see it near Horseshoe Lake, which is the south side of the mountain. So here is the areas where we see the dead trees. Um, you can visit these areas. There's a parking lot, which you can kind of see in this photo, um, that you can kind of go check out. I wouldn't hang out too long. Um, here's the area. Um, all of these trees in here cannot survive because of the CO2 that is being emitted from this volcano. Here's a kind of a look at some of those gas releases um, as they actually occur. So the CO2 from Mammoth Mountain is killing these trees at a rapid, rapid rate. Um, and it is composed of about 20 to 90% CO2, which is what's actually killing them. Um, there is less than 1% CO2 in soils outside of those tree killing areas. 
So these areas in particular are the highest concentration of CO2 we see anywhere near Mammoth Mountain. Um, so I would not live in this area. <laughs> um, other areas like Mammoth Lakes are a lot safer because the CO2 in those areas has not been picked up more than 1%. Um, but if you hang out in these areas for too long, you are going to be exposed to um, really high levels of CO2, which is not good for you. Not good for the trees either. All right, so looking at moving northward to the Cascades, this is a 500 mile chain of young volcanoes. These volcanoes are being produced from the subduction of the fair, or sorry, not the Fairland Plate, the Juan de Fuca Plate beneath North America. Um, this chain southern tip is in Northern California, which would be Lassen Peak. Um, it has 12 major volcanoes, two of which are in California. Mount Shasta is the second highest of those peaks. Um, and how do you think they formed? So let's take a look at where these volcanoes are. So Lassen and Shasta are down here in California. The rest of the Cascadian volcanoes are in Oregon and Washington. Um, and they are all very similar to each other in the type of volcano and um, kind of their formation. So a lot of them have the iconic peak that you are used to when you think about a volcano, they have that iconic peak, right? So these are composite stratovolcanoes that are in this really nice linear chain that extends north. So Mount Lassen actually last erupted in 1915. Um, it is an ex-stratovolcano. Um, it was destroyed by a huge eruption 600,000 to 200,000 years ago, and now it is mostly a felsic dome. So most of what we see is just a bunch of felsic material in this dome fashion. So it had its last modern eruption in 1915. This is actually a typo here. Um, and it was active again in 1921. Looking at Mount Shasta, which is much more impressive to look at because of the snow cap it's got, um, it's the largest stratovolcano of the Cascades. And it is much of the volcano is constructed of 13 different eruptions over the last 10,000 years. This is an image of Mount Shasta's eruptive episodes. So we have the Hotlum cone which is at the summit of Mount Shasta multiple eruptions that we see here 200 to 9400 years ago so that's this kind of red color it's the most extensive of the different um, episodes we have the Shastina cone which you can't even actually see on this guy very well um, there's a little bit over here to the right side of this image um, this erupted 9400 to 9700 years ago we have Misery Hill, which erupted less than 130,000 years ago, so that's the green. And then the blue is Sargent's Ridge, which erupted less than 250,000 years ago. So the most recent is our Hotlum Cone, which covers most of all of these other episodes up. All right, so Lassen Peak and its neighboring lava domes are not typical cone conical stratovolcanoes like Mount Shasta and Mount Rainier. Um, these large volcanoes were formed by repeated eruptions of lava and ash from a central summit vent over tens of thousands of years. The Lassen Dome Field, in contrast, is an example of the volcanic area that erupts lava from numerous individual vents, each of which is active for a few years or a few decades and usually does not erupt again. So this is kind of similar to Medicine Lake. So the Lassen region has been volcanically active for more than 3 million years. Um, and the Lassen Volcanic Center began to erupt about 600,000 years ago. From 600,000 to 400,000 years ago, eruptions built a large volcano, often referred to as Brokaw Volcano or Mount Tihima. So here's a look at Lassen Peak. Um, this is the location of the 1915 flow. Um, and then we see some of the other peaks nearby, um, Mount, D Mount Diller, excuse me, um, which is a lot of andesitic material. We have some daysite flow from um, Bumpass Mountain. Um, 
And then this is the schematic of where most geologists believe that Brokoff volcano um, used to extend to. So a lot of material kind of evacuated in perhaps a single eruption event. So Lassen Peak began as a volcanic vent on Mount Tehima's northern flank. It is considered the world's largest plug dome volcano, and it rises 2,000 feet to an elevation of 10,457 feet. The park's lava came from many vents, so the lava in the area is not from one single vent, kind of like we saw with Medicine Lake. Um, the recent geologic evidence indicates that the cinder cone, also a volcano, erupted in the 18th century. Eruptions of about 27,000 years ago formed Lassen Peak, probably in only a few years. And with a height of 2,000 feet and a volume of half a cubic mile, it is one of the largest lava domes on Earth. Moro Rock is another lava dome as well. Lassen Peak in the largest, is the largest of a group of more than 30 volcanic domes erupted over the past 300,000 years in the Lassen Volcanic National Park in Northern California. We see three main episodes of volcanism that have occurred at the Lassen Volcanic Center in the past 1,100 years. This would be Chaos Crags eruption, cinder cone eruption, and the summit eruption of 1914 to 1921, most of which occurred in 1915. The development of the Chaos Crags forms a typical silicic volcanic style, cycle. Um, the deposits originating from Chaos Crags indicate a complex eruption 1100 to 1000 years ago. This violent eruption was followed by the growth of five domes, three of which had hot dome collapse avalanches. Cinder cones in Lassen Volcanic National Park are 700 feet high volcanic cones, which look like your typical iconic cone shape, um, but they usually only erupt once and then they kind of fizz out. So a lot of what's produced here is scoria, which is the very uh, dark volcanic rock that has a lot of holes in it. So it's vesicular in nature. Um, but the recent studies, they are working in cooperation with the National Park Service to better understand the volcanic hazards in the Lassen area. Um, and they have firmly established that cinder cone, that the cinder cone was formed in eruptions about 1650. The eruption of the cinder cone is typically mafic, which I just said, and the eruptive episodes consist of four basaltic and acidic lavas, um, a complex vent cone, and an ash blanket that covers three, 200 to 300 square kilometers. Two lava flows have erupted before the ash blanket, and two followed the ash blanket. Um, so this was a fairly short-lived cinder cone um, in the area. So taking a closer look at the main eruption in our sort of time period um, that occurred in May on May 22nd, 1915. Um, this occurred in the late afternoon after two very quiet days on the peak. Um, Lassen exploded in a powerful eruption that blasted rock fragments and pumice high into the air. A huge column of volcanic ash and gas rose more than 30,000 feet into the air and was visible from as far away as Eureka, which is 150 miles to the west. Pumice fall, fell onto the northeastern slope of Lassen Peak, generated at a high-speed avalanche of hot ash, pumice, rock fragments, and gas, which would be a pyroclastic flow we've talked about previously. Um, this swept down the side of the volcano and devastated about three square mile area. The pyroclastic flow that rapidly incorporated and melted the snow in its path, the water from that melted snow transformed the flow into a lahar. So in May, May 19th through the 20th, there was a lahar that rushed down Lost Creek and made it all the way to Old Station. 
Um, this eruption was so powerful that it swept away the northeast lobe of the lava flow um, extruded two days earlier. The eruption produced smaller mud flows on all flanks of Lassen Peak, and it deposited a layer of volcanic ash and pumice that was traceable for 25 miles um, to the northeast and rained fine ash for at least as far away as Winnemucca, Nevada, which is 200 miles to the east. So here's a look at those areas. So here is Lassen Peak here. Um, it kind of shows you where those pyroclastic flows and lahars traveled. Um, if we look here, the late mud flows and the ash flows are in these kind of grayish. And then we see the lava flow and dome, the avalanche and mud flow in this really dark um, gray. Um, and then the ejection is all of these spots that we see here. So um, if you look to the north of Lassen Peak, you can see that there. So the 1914 to 17 series of explosive eruptions at Lassen Peak were some of the first volcanic eruptions to be extensively photographed, um, largely by Benjamin Franklin Loomis, a local businessman and amateur photographer. So you can kind of see what the area looked like before 1914 and in June of 1915. As shown in the left, you can see the northeastern flank of Lassen Peak was covered by a large conifer forest, and then on the right we see it disappear after the eruption of the volcano. The May 22nd, 1915 explosive eruption of 19 of Lassen Peak, excuse me, blasted rock fragments and pumice high into the air and rained fine ash, as I already discussed. So here's kind of an image of that. Um, this is one of the first volcanic eruptions to ever be photographed. This was actually taken from the town of Red Bluff, which is where I was born. Here's another image of the eruption as viewed from Red Bluff. Here's an image of where Red Bluff is versus Lassen Peak. So it's quite a ways away, but um, still a fairly decent view of the eruption. And here's a location of Winnemucca in Nevada. Um, here is Lassen Volcanic National Park. So ash fall was seen as far as Winnemucca in Nevada. So like I said, that's 200 miles away. So some of the hazards that came out of this, obviously there are lava flow hazards, ash fall hazards, um, and then there are combined hazard zones, which are gonna be very close to the peak. Um, and then we do see mud flow hazard zones, pyroclastic hazard zones, pyroclastic flows and mud flows are predominantly one of the biggest concerns if you live near one of the river channels in the area. So any of the stream channels are where we're going to see the mud flows and the pyroclastic flows predominantly follow um, because they are low-lying areas that have a clear path somewhere. Um, so those present huge problems outside of the volcano area in addition to ash flow hazards. Uh, ash fall hazard, excuse me, um, which can travel, like I said, up to 200 miles away. Here's a look at the deposits in, in around Lassen Peak. Um, we see some lake bed deposits towards the center of the peak, and as we move further out, we see a lot of andesite and dacite, um, and then we do see some river deposits, obviously, along some of the stream channels. Um, and then some granitic rocks actually have popped up in the area. So that shows that there might have been um, some old magma chamber that solidified underground and then has now been eroded and brought to the surface. Here's a look at the cross section of the area. Um, we can see uh, the core, which is where the actual peak would be or the cone. Um, this would be the main vent of the volcano, here are the all of these little offshoots here would have been where we would have seen magma plumes. It's Cascades Overlook here again. This is the broke off mountain um, that geologists 
perceive to have eroded away, um, perhaps from a single event or over time. And now we just see um, Lassen Peak along with all of these other peaks. There are hot springs in the area as well. Um, so if you go to Lassen National Park, you can visit some of these hot springs. I don't believe they let you swim in them anymore. Um, that was a thing kind of of the past. These are more uh, more on the dangerous variety of hot springs um, because they are still considered, the area is still considered volcanically active um, and there are still a lot of gases that are being released on a daily basis. Here's another image of the Lassen eruption in 1915. Here's another one from a view from Red Bluff. It's a pretty massive eruption. Pretty scary to see, honestly. Here is the summit of Lassen um, overlooking uh, Northern California. And here's what Lassen looks like today. Here's another view as you approach Lassen Peak. Um, so it's still a prominent peak in the area, um, but a lot of the forest has started to come back. Um, if we see another eruption in our time period, um, a lot of this landscape will drastically change from that eruption. Here are a look at some of the cinder cones um, that I was talking about earlier. Uh, there's a steep front of block lava flows from the 1666 eruption from the cinder cone. Um, and the lava flow fronts at the cinder cone range in height from 10 to 50 meters and are typically 20 to 30 meters high. All right, looking at Mount Shasta. So Mount Shasta began forming on the remnants of an older similar volcano that collapsed 300,000 to 500,000 years ago. Um, the eruptions at about 11,000 years ago built Black Butte and Shastina on the western flanks of Mount Shasta. Um, in the last few millennia, smaller eruptions have broken out at the volcano's summit and from vents on its upper east flank. Hot springs and volcanic gases seep from the summit, indicating a relatively young and still hot system. Uh, the record of eruptions over the last 10,000 years suggests that on average, at least one eruption occurs every 800 to 600 years at Mount Shasta. It was primarily constructed during four major cone building episodes that were centered on separate events. Each of the cone building periods produced andesitic lava flows, block and ash flows, and mud flows, originally mainly at the central vents. Construction of each cone was formed by more silicic eruptions of domes and pyroclastic flows at central vents and of domes, cinder cones, and lava flows at vents on the flanks of the cones. So looking at some of the Holocene eruptions on Mount Shasta, the eruptions during the last 10,000 years produced lava flows and domes on and around the flanks of Mount Shasta and pyroclastic flows from summit and flank vents extend as far as 12.4 miles from the summit. Most of these eruptions produced large mud flows, many of which reached more than several tens of kilometers from Mount Shasta. Shastina was formed mainly between 9,700 and 9,400 years ago. Uh, the Hotlum Cone, which forms the summit and the north and the north and northwest slopes of Shasta, may overlap Shastina in age, but most of the Hotlum Cone is probably younger. So Shastina is a large subsidiary cone that rises about 12,330 feet and lies on the flank of Mount Shasta, which is 1.8 miles west of the volcano's summit. It was formed mainly between 9,700 and 9,400 year, years ago. 9,400 years ago, excuse me. Uh, early eruptions of andesitic lava flows formed um, and a later growth of Shastina's main cone, several main small domes grew within um, a central crater. During either of the formation or the destruction of one of these domes, Shastina erupted pyroclastic flows that roared down Driller Canyon, sorry, Diller Canyon, and buried the present sites of Weed and Mount Shasta City. 
Here's a look at Shastina here. Here's the main summit of Mount Shasta. And here is Shastina. Black Butte is also in the Mount Shasta area. It is a group of overlapping dacite domes um, about 13 kilometers or eight miles west of Mount Shasta. It erupted during the Holocene and the intrusion of the domes about 95, 100 years ago was accompanied by the formation of extensive pyroclastic flows. So here's a look at Black Butte. And in summary, I know this was a long, long one. <laughs> Although the Cascades were formed essentially by subduction, there is much more in the story. It is ex an extremely volcanically complex area that has eruptions of basalt, andesite, and rhyolite, as well as many types in between, which is not your cookie cutter. Three volcano types, three different rock types. Okay, so here I'll leave you with this beautiful image of Shasta. And there's one more as the sun sets. All right, I'll catch you guys in the next video. Bye.